Welcome back to the Pension Confident Podcast. I'm Philippa Lamb. Today, we're talking about something we think isn't talked about enough. Financial abuse. Could it be happening to you or someone close to you? How do you spot it and what can you do about it? All abuse against older people is hugely underreported. We don't really know how much this goes on. It usually happens with either a close friend, family member. So it's someone you know. Someone you know. Older people don't see themselves represented as victims of abuse. Here to discuss this topic, we have Danny Tatlow, who's Research and Policy Officer at the abuse prevention charity Hourglass. They focus specifically on older people. And from Pension B, JP Soul is with us again. She's their VP of Second Line Compliance. And she's seen this sort of abuse in her career in banking and pensions. Hi, both. Thank you for having me. The usual disclaimer before we start, please remember anything we discuss on the podcast shouldn't be regarded as financial advice or legal advice and when investing your capital is at risk. And just to add, today's conversation, it's a sensitive topic. So if you've been affected by anything that we talk about in this episode, do check out the show notes because you'll find a list of resources and organisations there that can help you. So economic abuse is a legally recognised form of domestic abuse, isn't it? And financial abuse... That can be part of it. I think we've all heard of it, but I was really surprised to discover that one in five women have been subjected to that sort of abuse. So it can really happen to anyone, can't it? I think it's one out of seven for men, actually, uh, as well. But I find that it can happen to anyone who is vulnerable or anyone who um, needs care or assistance. Obviously, women are more impacted. I think uh, that's just due to like societal standards, uh, but it could really happen to anyone. And Danny, as I say, you focus specifically on older people. You see this a lot. Oh, definitely, Philippa. It's the the most prevalent um, type of abuse that we deal with. It makes up about 40% of the cases and calls that we receive normally. And yeah, it can happen to anyone. We generally see... Um, about 60% of the victim survivors um, are, are women, but about sort of 30 to 40% uh, men too. And sadly, this is often by a family member. Always, generally, really? um, we see by a family member or an intimate partner. Around 82% uh, in 23, 24 of the cases we saw, the perpetrator was a family member. Most normally this is uh, sons and daughters. OK. And this is the sort of things that we're talking about here. This is coercing someone about someone about their will or a lasting power of attorney, property, inheritance, that sort of thing. It can even be just as simply uh, as taking um, money from um, an older person's bank account or anyone's bank account without their consent, um, stealing or theft from inside the home, as well as, you said, lasting power of attorney abuse or, yeah, coercion of housing deeds or changing of one's will, as well as ones that are more niche, uh, like romance, abuse and predatory marriage. Yeah, and we've got what's called, I think, mate crime as well, haven't they? This act of befriending a vulnerable person with the clear intent of exploiting them. Mate crime or cuckooing as well. Cuckooing. Yeah, cuckooing. Um, it's generally uh, seen uh, as part of county line drug gangs. A member will move into the, the house or befriend a vulnerable or older person and then sell... Could be drugs, could be guns, other aspects, illegal items from the house. So they just use the premises? Use the premises, but also could utilise the, the vulnerable or older person to pay off drug debts. OK. And thinking about particularly vulnerable groups, obviously I'm thinking about immigrants perhaps with language difficulties, people with learning difficulties. I'm guessing that that's, that's something you see too. Definitely. A lot of the cases we deal with... Um, are those that may not have mental capacity because of potentially dementia or Alzheimer's. Immigrants, refugees have a very tough time accessing support because of sort of fear that the police will um, turn them over to the Home Office or, yeah. or immigration. Yeah. So, JP, you, you work at Pension B now, you worked in banking before. You've seen a lot of this, haven't you? Most of the cases that I've seen are very similar. I find that there's a lot of familiar fraud that happens, and I say familiar because it usually happens with either a close friend, family member. So it's someone you know. Someone you know. And most time, children, sons, daughters. And it's really, really sad because, like, I don't think a lot of awareness is out there because why wouldn't you trust um, a family member. Yeah, or, if you're going to trust or, anyone, or, it's going to be a family, a friend. isn't it? I remember when I used to work in banking, a lady who, who was a pensioner, um, she would come in usually to get her money for the week. And she had come on one of her visits and she went to the cashier and she couldn't take her money out because there was nothing there. And she was distraught, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and 
we later found out that she had a credit card, which she was aware that she had. Um, her son had helped her to take one out because he had kind of told her it was a good idea to get one. Okay. She had a big balance and he had kind of like used up and maxed out her credit card without her knowing. And because he also helped her to look after her letters and her bills, she had no idea that this was happening. And so her entire pension was kind of like taken. So it just drained her entire account? Drained everything. And it went further because even her gas and electric had already kind of like stacked up because he didn't get paid. Now, bear in mind that, you know, her son was also vulnerable. He had lost his job and he was trying to look after his family. But nevertheless, he put his mum in a very terrible situation. What happened? We worked out a repayment uh, plan for her. I mean, how much where was I it? A in. lot of money. It was about 5000 And obviously, interest had gone on top of that. So we, we worked out a very, very minimal amount that she would repay every month. And that allowed her to still be able to eat. I went as far as at the time, because I felt so sorry for her, calling uh, British Gas as well to kind of like yeah. get a payment plan sorted for her and explaining what had happened to her. That was so sweet of you. She must have been, she must have been horrified. She was horrified. She was in tears most of the time. But I think within like two weeks, she, I, I was able to put a smile back on her face and she was she was okay. She but was... she didn't bring charges against her son, did she? No, unfortunately not. And, and I think that's usually the challenge uh, when it's a, a close family member or a friend is that emotions get in the way. And although it was reported to the police, she decided not to press charges. So her son didn't actually get reprimanded for what he had done. That's amazing. Do you see that a lot, Danny? A lot of the victim survivors we deal with, they, they don't want to criminalise their family members. They may not even see it themselves as abuse, um, but just what is owed. It's messy, isn't it? It's, it's it is very, it's very messy, unfortunately. Hi, it's me, Philippa, just interrupting for a moment to say a big thanks to all of you who've subscribed to the Pension Confident podcast. Our mission is to help you feel more financially confident and we are thrilled with the community we're growing here on YouTube. If you haven't already done it, hit that subscribe button right underneath this video so you never miss an episode. Meantime, enjoy the rest of this month's conversation. It must mean it's underreported. It must mean we don't really know how much this goes on. All abuse against older people is, is, is hugely underreported, and, and this is for a number of reasons. Older people don't see themselves represented as, as victims of abuse um, in organisations and in sort of media. Uh, there are ageist attitudes that stop older, older people coming forward. There's also sort of the cultural milieu that many older people uh, grew up in, wherein this is a family matter. They don't, they don't want to get um, external yeah. organisations involved. I'm wondering if digital is making this much easier, because obviously if we... I don't for a second want to suggest that older people don't understand how digital works, but... I'm guessing there will be some, maybe at the right at the outer edge of the age we're talking about, who have not got their arms round the digital world we now live in. So banking and financial paperwork, if their family members take that on and do it in, a, in do it online and there aren't letters coming through the door anymore, that must make it easier because they, they really do completely lose control, don't they? They don't know what's going on with their money. Yeah, there is definitely a fear that the, the digital divide uh, is, is ever expanding and that's making abuse easier. With the closure of, of high street bank branches and the worsening ability to be actually able to talk to uh, a human member of staff rather yes. than AI or a chatbot. It is, it's hard. It is much harder for for many older victim survivors to to realise where their money is going. Yeah, because back in the day, you'd walk into a, a bank branch, wouldn't you, and talk to someone. But I mean, particularly mobility issues, transport, public transport, all that sort of stuff. That's not an easy thing to do, is it? There isn't always a local branch. No, and this is sort of linked to to other aspects that austerity uh, has led us, uh, the sort of the worsening of public transport routes. It's much harder, really, for rural-based yes. older people um, in order to get to, to branches. TSB uh, and sort of the Courtship Bank, they have safe spaces in their branches. And unfortunately, because of the closure of branches, these are sort of far and uh, few and far yeah. between. So there's a real um, disconnect. There's Yeah, there is unfortunately a real disconnect. Well, see, we think about consequences. Some of them are going to vary, aren't they, depending on what stage of your life we're talking about. I think we can kind of see where perhaps the older people and um, the outcomes might be. But at worst, presumably at any age, I mean, this can take you to a place where you're unable to afford the basics that you need to live. We see sort of post-abuse um, effects 
ranging from mental health issues, depression, PTSD, anxiety, a withdrawal from society. But there's also, especially for older people, but for all victims, um, the potential for physical-based health effects as well. It can even lead to premature premature death, unfortunately, as well as you said, Philippa, the, the economic um, effects, whereas it might be the increase of debt that they're, yeah. they're not able to get rid of, the loss of their house that they may have lived in for a long time, or affecting their pension. Yeah, I mean, JP, this is what you're talking about, isn't it? Thinking about debt, you know, if you're in debt and you're just not in a position to pay it back, that's going to put you at risk of of worse outcomes, isn't it? Because then you may have to resort to you know, lenders that you really ideally would not be approaching, paying elevated levels of interest on the loans that you then have to take out. I mean, I'm interested to know what the law says about this, because obviously theft is a criminal offence. If you've got someone literally taking your valuables and selling them, that's a more straightforward, though a bit terrible situation. But financial abuse, I'm guessing that can be harder to pin down because it can get a bit he said, she said. Is that how it goes? And so harder to actually take action, legal action, even if a victim wants to. It can be. Like you said, Philippa, a lot of these issues come under uh, existing uh, criminal law, theft, blackmail, uh, criminal damage, aspects like that. Yeah. Also, with under the uh, 2021 Domestic Abuse Act, economic abuse was, was listed there. Also, recent legislation around coercive control. Yes, because so that's quite recent, isn't it? That is quite recent. And yeah, a lot of the times it can be um, sort of difficult to pinpoint what is going on, um, especially, as we said, when it's a family member and wherein an older person or any victim may see, um, oh, it's just a, a family taking what is going to be theirs anyway. I'm guessing it's not always families, and presumably people in care roles on occasion? There is a public idea that um, the, the largest perpetrator group of abuse is carers, pay carers, professional carers in nursing homes. That That is not the case not at true. all. Intimate partners and, and family members generally, you do, we, we maybe see about four to five percent of our um, cases dealing with uh, professional carers in economic abuse. So it's quite low numbers, but that's not to say that doesn't happen. What we see a lot of is that potentially an older person is put into a, a care or a nursing home. They may have a power of attorney or not. And then the attorney or the their family members or intimate partners, while they're in the nursing home and have little idea about the contents within their house, may steal from them, may uh, take the deed okay and presumably smaller stuff like cashing checks and cashing checks yeah okay i've i've seen a few have you pensions yeah in my current role i'll i'll say the the types that i see at the moment family members I, and i know you mentioned carers but i find like it's usually spouses and children so when the customer is vulnerable and they need assistance or they need help they usually seek help from whoever's closest to them and they trust them with things like their passwords like access to their emails right. bank accounts letters and sometimes it happens right there in their home i've seen situations where a customer has been really ill and so he had to rely on his neighbor to kind of help him sort out his finances and a lot of his funds were being moved over by the neighbour. Out of his pension? Out of his pension. There's several cases we've had children, like sons. There's one I remember very clearly. The son was also very vulnerable, had a gambling addiction, while helping his dad manage um, his pension, took out quite a lot of it. And it's difficult because sometimes people have joint accounts with their loved ones. They have joint accounts with their children, their spouses. So it's hard to know if something bad is going on. It is hard to know. And again, people don't press charges. They report to the police, but they don't take any action afterwards. And the police can only help you if you allow them to do their job. But most people, they want to keep it in the family and they say, like, this is a family matter. So firms that provide financial services, they put in place anti-financial abuse controls. What sort of measures can you put in place to protect customers? I think this is where I think we should shed a lot of light on the importance of know your customer um, checks. What do they consist of? So it could go from us trying to make sure that we identify that our customer is who they say they are. A lot of people, consumers, they usually frown upon how stringent 
these checks are because sometimes it might be us asking for your ID, asking for a proof of address, doing a facial similarity check, which is where you do like a selfie and we check your ID as well. And people frown upon it because they're like, well, I'm it's me. Like, why? Why are you checking? And it me? takes time. Yeah. yeah. And, and it takes time and they don't really like it. When fraud happens, I've had experience with people saying, well, what did you do to protect my money? Did you do your checks? What I'd like people to do is to be more open and embrace these checks that we do. So although sometimes we kind of sense it as you, we will check and make sure before we hand your money over that you are who you say you are. See, this is interesting because there is a UK finance financial abuse code of practice, isn't there? So presumably there this, is. this is part of all that? Yes, there is a code of practice. Um, it is part of it. I think all firms, I mean, there's so many regulations that we're bound by to make sure that we can mitigate the risk of financial abuse and we're able to protect our customers. The consumer duty, the recent one, is is definitely a huge one that I know like a firm like Pension B conforms to and by making sure that we're protecting our customers. But also, we know that there are a lot of vulnerable customers, so there are regulations around how you can treat your vulnerable customers and how you're supposed to support them and help them. And then there's financial crime regulations as well that help us to put controls in place to kind of avoid these things happening. It's interesting what you say about people kind of pushing back on the whole, you know, proving their identity thing. So like we've all been there, haven't we, when you're yeah. applying for something. You know, how many how many things do you need? I've given you this, I've given you that. You know, really do we need to do more? But as you say, it's about framing why, because I think when you're on the receiving end of that, you're thinking, it's about me. But actually, you're like, actually, it's kind of not about you. It's about what else might be going on around you or other people around you. We're keeping you safe from things you might not even be aware of. We're safeguarding your funds. We have a responsibility to make sure that your money is safe. So we will take every step that we need to to make sure that we're keeping it safe because we're accountable for anything that happens to your money. So we need to take the steps that we need to uh, to ensure that, you know, it doesn't get into the wrong hands. Should we move on to what people can do to protect themselves? Because obviously the ideal outcome here is that it doesn't happen or it happens less. I mean, I'm thinking around things like financial services. That's got to be about the basics, like keeping your login and details private. Absolutely. I always say, especially like um, with like digital firms or firms that deal online, some people have joint emails um, they share with their spouses, their children. It's better to have a sole account where you only have access to. And if you do share access with somebody else, it's important to keep an eye on what happens in your account. Have notifications set up on your phone so that something pops up when anything changes on your account. So it's keeping your login details secure. Personally speaking, I'll say, don't share your email with anyone and, and keep that sole access to yourself. Yeah. And check in regularly on your bank accounts, check in reg regularly on your pension accounts. It, it could take about a few seconds a day, just pop in and have a look because you might catch something and be like, wait, that doesn't kind of look right. I think most people don't know you can get support from the firm themselves because you can ring in and ask for support directly and say look I don't know too much about the internet I don't know too much about checking my account can you tell me what's going on thankfully like at Pension B there's still that human connection you can contact your beekeeper and say hey I'm struggling with this thing. Can you help me or show me how to do it? Financial institutions do offer support. They should offer more support. A lot of the online banks aren't signed up to the UK Finance Code of Practice. They're not? No. OK. Um, why not? You think that would be a no-brainer, wouldn't you? You think it would be a no-brainer. I, I I can't answer why they're not signed up to it. So That's something to watch if you're picking a bank, Something presumably. Definitely, definitely. Um, actually, Hourglass, well, after this has come out, and we'll have released a report around uh, the most accessible banks to use for um, older adults. OK, well, if you let us have a link to that, we'll put it in the show notes. We'll do. Thank you. I'm interested to know how we spot this, because this is a thing that can creep up on people. I think if it's happening to you, maybe it feels normal. If it's in a relationship, you know, our own stuff always feels normal to us, doesn't it? Maybe we don't feel like we're being coercively controlled. What should we be looking for in our own lives and maybe in the lives of people who matter to us? that will be red flags around maybe this is going on. The consumer or the customer not knowing or having information about their uh, finances or not knowing what's happening or not even knowing whether they had an account in the first place okay. um, yeah. or not. So it's that 
having no knowledge or no information about their finances. It's about loss of agency sometimes, isn't it, as well? You know, having someone who's always just, you know, taking care of the money, taking care of the finances, and somehow you don't really know what's going on. And a lot of people in relationships domestic relationships, there's often one person who does that, isn't there? It gets handed over, like the washing or the cleaning. That is so, you know, one person does it. That is so correct because um, I find what I've noticed is one person deals with all the finances. And sometimes you'll be on a phone to a customer um, and they would say, speak to my partner. They don't even know any of their information at all. Perhaps this might be a reason to kind of learn a bit more and not solely rely on the other person yeah. for that information. I mean, you don't have to be doing it, but you need to understand what's going on, don't you? Yes. Just kind of check in now and again with your own accounts, just see just what's see happening. What's going on. How do most cases of this come to you, Danny, at a charity? It's a mixture, really. We we see a lot of um, cases where there's been a lasting power of attorney brought out. Obviously, um, for that to happen, the person taken out has to have mental capacity at the time it's taken out. And then potentially the the, the attorney that they've chosen then um, then commits abuse, maybe takes more money than, than is just for um, just for the, the person, the, the victim. Or treats themselves because they feel that they've worked they've worked hard as an they attorney. They deserve it. And they then they deserve it. Mm. The the victim may have, have lost mental capacity in this time as well, so that makes it even even harder. Um so we see a lot of lot of uh, cases around lasting power attorney. Who um, approaches you though? Is it is it the victim or is it friends of the victim? Or how do you actually get to hear about it? We generally see about seventy percent of, of calls are from um, what we deem concerned others, be they friends, right. strangers, other family members, and then about 30% are the victims themselves. But if someone comes to you and says, I'm worried about my neighbour, I think maybe the you know family member is draining their bank account, what, what can you actually do about that? Well, we'd give them a, a number of options. Obviously, if they feel that their the, the neighbour is in, in real danger, we'd suggest them to, to call the police. A lot of times... Older victim survivors don't, as we've said, don't want to go down that route. So then we'd tell them about their, their local adult safeguarding team, which the local government runs. Other organisations, the OPG, if which OPG. is the Office of the Public Guardian, which is responsible for uh, investigating um, abuse around power of attorney. If they are local or in areas that we have frontline staff, we may use an IDVA service, which is uh, an independent domestic violence advocate to sort of talk to them to, to to work them through their abuse okay and also as jp has said to, suggesting they ring their bank um as i said a lot of banks banks like tsb even have flea funds where they will um, give money to victim survivors of abuse in order for them to flee their perpetrators so if you literally have no access to money they can help you exactly we'd also recommend um refuges um other organizations that may be able to assist if they're in, in real danger or other financial organizations such as action fraud if they're suffering from fraud or scams and in terms of kind of substantiating what you think is going on I guess gathering documents is going to be a good thing, isn't it? So that if you leave, you've actually got some evidence with you. I mean, obviously, I appreciate it's not always paper nowadays, but if you need to leave and open bank accounts or claim benefits or um, prove your economic status, you're going to need some stuff, aren't you, for the organisations you're going to be dealing with? Yeah, definitely. I mean, an issue with this is obviously... If you're a victim of abuse or coercive control, then the perpetrator generally may have taken that from you already. Obviously, if you can get these documents um, and sort of evidence of financial abuse or, um, as you said, papers detailing your financial accounts, so much the better. But a lot of the time, it's, it's so much better to, to go to an organisation that can then help you, even if you can't get this paperwork and just sort of escape from the the perpetrator themselves obviously the most important thing is is keeping victim survivors safe and getting them away from that abusive situation Absolutely. even if they don't have the paperwork with them yeah putting a stop to it and as we say awareness and prevention is the key here isn't it rather than dealing with the consequences and i think if we were to just kind of loop back to that again for people to think about that you should just never not know what's going on with your finances is that right 
That's correct. I, 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 I cannot stress it enough. Always keep an eye on what's going on. Even if it's people you love. Even if it's people, especially if it's people <laughs> well, that's you love. that's very cynical. That's too cynical. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying, like, don't trust a good family member or close family member or a friend. But it's self-care, isn't it? It is self-care because people might be going through challenges themselves. They might be going through vulnerabilities themselves. They might not be doing it intentionally. They might not be able to help themselves. So I, I think it's important to always keep an eye on what's going on make sure you're not sharing your password if it's your home why would you want to hide your passport your actual I I identity cards away but keep it in a safe place not everybody needs to have access to your passport not everybody needs to have access to your uh, driver's license and I'm saying this more particularly for older consumers if somebody puts a phone to your face they might not always be taking a selfie for fun they might be validating a KYC okay. procedure. So just be conscious, not not to be, I'm not trying to scare anybody, but be conscious that this can happen and make sure that you're keeping an eye on your finances, your bank accounts, your pension accounts. Set up alerts. Alerts are really good now. You can set it for as low as even a pound. So if something moves in your account, you will know about it straight you away. You would know about it straight away. Set up 2FA, so two-factor authentication, which means it will come to your mobile phone before anybody can log in. Obviously, I'm not saying everyone should not trust their family members or their friends, but just keep an eye on it. If you keep an eye on it, then you'll be in the know. You know what's going on. You can spot straight away when something changes or something shifts. And then you can ask questions and be able to get to the bottom of it before it's too late. Before we wrap this up, let's just have a quick chat about powers of attorney, because these are important. You hand over enormous power to the people you pick. And I know you've both got some thoughts about the shortcomings that exist on the current system. So last year, uh, an act was passed, Power of Attorney Act, um, digitising powers of attorney. We at Algas also have some issues with existing lack of safeguards um, around powers of attorney. There is a lot of abuse, as we see, between 2010 and 2020, 2020 the OPG saw around 20,000 cases. This of is abuse. the regulator. Sorry, the, yes, of the, the Office of the, the Public Guardian saw around 20,000 cases. So a lot. Um, yeah, and there's a fear that sort of the, the digitization of power of attorneys, which we can understand why the, the, the Office of the Public Guardian is pushing for this because of the amounts of paperwork that they right. had to deal with before, that this could lead to, to more forms of abuse, more abuse of it. So um, you don't like you don't like the digitization either? No, I, I, I found the older process a lot better at the time when I was dealing with power of attorneys because it was easier to be able to see like all the signatures and it was easier to be able to contain any changes that happen. I feel like the digital version doesn't feel as safe to me. There is a useful safeguard you can put in place there though, isn't that? You don't just have to have one person dealing with your power of attorney. You can appoint yeah, is you there can, a limit to the number of people? Because they can kind of police each other, can't they? You can appoint several. And I think it's probably better to have like a couple of people, probably even three people. And you can make the rule where they all have to jointly agree. Before, on any decision. On any decision. So that way you're not leaving your entire finances in one person's hands. Really useful pointers. Thank you both very much indeed. Really, really interesting and helpful, I hope. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. As I said at the top, if you have been affected by any of the issues we talked about or you think it might be happening to you, then your first stop is to go to the show notes on this episode page. You'll find the links we've talked about right there to Danny's organisation, Hourglass, and others like Surviving Economic Abuse that can help you. Thanks for being with us. If you found the episode helpful, please do rate and review us. And just before we go, a last reminder that anything discussed on the podcast shouldn't be regarded as financial or legal advice and when investing your capital is at risk. We'll see you next time when we'll be taking the long view of the whole pensions industry with Pension B founder and CEO Romy Savova. Why did she think a whole lot of things needed changing when she first started in it 10 years ago? How did she set about doing that? And where does she think there's still work to be done? So insider insights there from a serious pensions expert. Do not miss it. Mm -hmm.